Hello, everyone, and welcome for joining us. Welcome to the Gen North America webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Yerado Abrahamian from the Gen North America Steering Group, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar on a novel approach to patient and caregiver engagement. Before we start, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the American Academy of Neurology for kindly allowing us access to their webinar platform today. We appreciate your generosity. Also, thank you to the more than 50 guideline community members who participated in our in-person open space event last month at the HRQ offices in Maryland. We had great enthusiasm and great learnings and are motivated to host more in-person events in the future. Um, just some housekeeping, within a week the recording of this webinar will be available on the GEN website in the Library Webinars tab. As well, I want to remind you that registration is open for the annual GEN conference, which will be held in Adelaide, Australia this year. Abstract submission closes within a few weeks, so please submit your abstracts if interested in presenting. And our next webinar will be in two weeks, and it's going to feature Dr. Holger Schunemann, who will speak to us about the GRADE methodology, what's new, what's next. We will send out registration information for this webinar later today, so please look for it in your email. Let's get to today's talk. Our presenters today are Dr. Dmitry Khodjikov and Brian Denger. Dr. Khodjikov is a senior sociologist at the RAND Corporation and a professor at the RAND Party Graduate School. His research focuses primarily on methods of expert elicitation, patient and stakeholder engagement, interpretation and program evaluation, community-based participatory research, and ethics of stakeholder-engaged research. He is particularly interested in developing new scalable approaches for online expert and stakeholder engagement. Dimitri's work has been funded by PCORI, NIH, CMS, and AHRQ, among others. He is a recipient of major national and international awards. Brian Denger is the Collaborative Programs Administrator for Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. He is the father of two sons who were diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the 1990s. Soon thereafter, Brian became involved with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, helping families locate and advocate for special education services and health benefit programs. Brian has also participated in Centers for Disease Control Supported Muscular Dystrophy Activities and served as the public member for Muscular Dystrophy Committees at the National Institutes of Health. In terms of ReadyTalk housekeeping, please note that you've been muted upon entry. Please do not unmute yourself and please do not place this on hold. We've allotted about 30 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. Throughout the presentation, please submit your questions at the lower left of your screen. We will convey your questions to our speakers at the end of the session. Um, so let's get started. Dimitri? Thank you, Rado. Uh, let me make sure yep, that I share over. the screen. One second. PowerPoint. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Gin North America for inviting me and Brian to share the results of our methods development, uh, development project funded by Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And before we get going, I would like to thank all of our participants who participated in our project by helping us develop the new method. And that includes individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, caregivers, family members, clinicians, guideline developers, experts on RAND UCLA appropriateness methods, experts on patient engagement. And without their contributions and willingness to help, uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, actually complete this project. As I mentioned, the project was funded to develop a new online approach to guideline development, and we used uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy guidelines as an example. Uh, we believe, however, that this method is applicable not only to Duchenne 
but also to other rare diseases as well as more common chronic and chronic conditions. So um, I will start this um, presentation with a brief introduction to uh, Duchenne and Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Guidelines. I will then speak briefly about patient engagement and guideline development a little bit more broadly and focus specifically on our method. Then Brian will take um, over and talk a little bit about what we call substantive findings from our study. So what did patients and caregivers say about um, Duchenne clinical guidelines? I should note that uh, they are formally called uh, Duchenne clinical uh, care considerations. Um, so, but I will use these two terms interchangeably throughout the presentation. And then I will share the results of our evaluation of patient experiences with the new method. So without further ado, um, let me start by saying that the Duchenne muscular dystrophy care considerations were originally developed in 2010 and then later updated in 2018. This, the, they were funded uh, by CDC, and both the original and updated care considerations were published in the Lancet Neurology. Um, these care considerations were intended to raise the standards of uh, care for Duchenne, help clinicians provide the best possible care to people with DMD, and give families and caregivers the necessary information to manage their care. So the 2018 updates included new clinical evidence that was published since 2010, a renewed focus on patient quality of life, and new sections of, um, that were added, including sections on endocrine and both health, uh, bone health care. So for those of you who may not be too familiar with Duchenne, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a rare genetic disorder that typically affects males. Um, it is characterized by progressive loss of the skeletal heart and lung muscles. Boys are typically diagnosed when they're between three and five years of age. Only one in 4,600 boys has Duchenne, and at the same time, 20,000 new diagnoses are made each year. Duchenne has a predictable course and is typically fatal for boys by late 20s. People born with DMD <clears throat> will see many healthcare providers throughout their lives, and it is hard to overestimate the burden of this condition on, Duchenne, on families with Duchenne. In developing care considerations, unfortunately, patients and caregivers were not actively involved. Um, out of the 11 topics that were covered in um, the uh, revi revised version of care considerations, um, three were new topics, and as I mentioned earlier, they include endocrine management. Um, each topic had its own working group, and um, each group consisted of anywhere between five and 15 members. While all the groups included clinicians, only some groups had advocacy group representatives, and only one group included a patient representative. Um, the endocrine management group had the, what was the smallest, is five, consisted of five members, and it did not include advocacy group representatives or um, patient representatives directly. As we know from the literature, however, uh, including patients and caregivers can help ensure a patient-centeredness of guidelines and facilitate their use in practice. <clears throat> Patients and caregivers can help identify topics and outcomes of interest. Um, they can um, shape the content and the scope of guidelines through their contributions, um, in particular by describing their personal experiences of disease, and that's a rare disease that's particularly important for Duchenne, um, identifying issues that may be overlooked by clinicians, um, they can also directly affect recommendation development, um, influencing guideline structure and how, uh, what language was used in the guideline to make sure that it's clear to patients. They can also facilitate guideline dissemination and implementation, uh, develop patient versions of guidelines in particular is something that um, is important to remember, and improving adherence to guideline recommendations. So although the research shows that these are all the benefits of um, engaging um, patients in guideline development, that unfortunately was not um, the case in the recent updates uh, of care considerations. Um, we know that guidelines group want to engage patients and caregivers, but engagement is logistically challenging. Um, oftentimes it requires a huge commitment on part of um, uh, patients and caregivers um, it oftentimes requires travel to a centralized location. It could be very costly as well. 
Um, moreover, it's not always clear who should represent patients during guideline development. Should it be a patient advocate? Should it be directly a patient caregiver? Um, so um, it's an open question. Um, groups composition can influence guideline quality. There is a lot of research, some of it was done at RAND early on, um, that shows that who is on your guideline development group affects what the guideline um, could recommend. Uh, engagement of patients with rare diseases is particularly challenging. With Duchenne, um, there are um, a lot of difficulties actually um, because patients have limited mobility. Um, so traveling to a meeting is not really an option in this particular instance. That's what, what was one of the reasons why um, patients may not have been actively engaged in developing of these guidelines. And moreover, there is no consensus on how um, large in numbers of patients and caregivers can best participate in the process of guideline development. So there was a literature review done that shows that uh, there are five methods that are most commonly used um, to engage patients in guideline development. And the most commonly used is um, participation in a guideline developing or guideline working group. Um, the second most frequently used was focus group followed by individual interviews with patients. Um, followed by a workshop, meeting, or a seminar, and surveys and opinion polls are um, also on the list of frequently used methods. Um, most of these methods, however, are not quite scalable. A lot of them require face-to-face -face interaction, like participation in a guideline working group, focus group, um, or a workshop meeting or a seminar. This is not really um, uh, feasible for a lot of families um, that we are working with. Um, the ones that are scalable, um, the methods that might be scalable, such as surveys, for example, they're not interactive or engaging enough. And one can argue they're not too meaningful because survey participants oftentimes may not even realize that their answers are going to directly impact the guideline development. Um, the, uh, these methods um, may also, um, they can uh, not be really uh, helping participants build their capacity, um, or participants oftentimes may not learn anything new uh, from sharing their information. If you just do a survey or if you do an interview, you know, it's a really a one-way communication rather than a two-way communication that happens between uh, participants and researchers or guideline development in this, in this case. So, um, what, how should the patient engagement um, look like in guideline development? So we argue that the methods that we use for patient engagement and guideline development should be systematic, replicable, and scalable. And this is exactly what we are trying to do in this project, is to develop a method that is systematic, um, meaning that it consistently collects information using a scientific methodology that is replicable and scalable. Ideally, the method should be also similar to how clinicians participate in guideline development. So uh, we tasked ourselves with developing a method that maximizes participants' unique expertise. So instead of asking patients and caregivers to comment on things that clinicians are more likely uh, to have most knowledge, we want to make sure that the method that we're developing maximizes participants' knowledge and their experiences. Uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that the way that we engage patients and caregivers is exactly uh, or is similar to how clinicians are engaged in the process. Not what, they were, not what we are asking them to do, but how we ask them to contribute to the guideline development process. We want to make sure that the methods can accommodate large and diverse groups of participants um, even though it's a rare disease, the experience of Duchenne patients and families is, is diverse, and we want to make sure that we get as many of them uh, to share their experience as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that at the same time, the method that we develop is not burdensome and convenient to participants so, uh, and enjoyable at the same time. Uh, given that um, they have limited mobility, we shouldn't, the method should not require travel to a centralized location. So should, they should be able to contribute from um, their own homes. Um, ideally, even though we developed the method using um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy as a case study, we feel that the methods of engagement should not be really specific to a particular disease. 
Um, while they might be tailored, but the, the overall, the method of the whole um, should not be disease specific. So to develop a new method, we assembled a diverse team of researchers from RAND, um, uh, as well as caregivers and individuals with Duchenne. So Brian represents the caregiver perspective. We have a clinician and genetic counselor from Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, which is the largest advocacy organization for Duchenne in the United States. Um, our team also includes a, parent, a project advisory board that consists of an individual living with Duchenne, a caregiver, two guideline developers, a genetic counselor, and an expert of the, on the RAND UCLA appropriateness method. This is the method that was used to develop care considerations, both the original and the revised versions. Um, at this point, the method that we've developed fits well with the later stages of guideline development where the recommendations are being developed and in disseminating and implementing recommendations. However, we believe that the kind of the structure, the idea behind the method is really applicable to other stages of guideline development as well. I just want to um, note that due to funding limitations, uh, we, were not work, we were not allowed to work with um, the draft recommendations. Uh, we worked with the final version of care considerations for the purposes of developing this um, method. However, ideally, this method should be used prior to um, the final guide, the prior to the time when the final wording of the guideline has been approved. Um, so our method has been, in, has been inspired by three different methods. First is the Delphi method. And from the Delphi method, we took the idea of iteration, idea of feedback, and idea of anonymity. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, Delphi is, um, is based on the notion of uh, rounds. So you collect data from participants through multiple rounds by providing feedback to them on the results of the previous rounds before the next round starts. So this is the idea of you um, ask them to answer questions, you provide them with their uh, own response, uh, with uh, showing how their own response compares to that of the group, and asking them to re-answer the original set of questions in light of group feedback um, on the previous round. So the method, the Delphi method, is also based on the idea of anonymity, where participants do not know who others are, and so that they could judge the quality and the substance of the information without being affected by who the other participant is. The second method that affected our approach is the Rancher CLA appropriateness method. So from this method that was used uh, to develop care considerations, we're borrowing the nine-point rating scales uh, we are borrowing the idea that in addition to asking participants what they think and showing what other people thought, we um, want to make sure that participants have an opportunity to directly engage with other participants uh, by asking questions, sharing their perspectives. And we're also borrowing the analytic procedures for determining consensus. You might have heard the Delphi method is a consensus developing method. So we want to make sure that the way that we analyze the ratings the, um, that we collect from participants is really analyzed using previously validated um, methodologies. So the three things that we're borrowing from the Rancho CLA method, nine-point rating scales, analytic procedures, and the importance of discussion among participants. And finally, from the grade methodology, we are really uh, borrowing this idea of um, how uh, to assess the replicability of panel findings to determine whether they're consistent um, with each other. Uh, the uh, Delphi method and all expert panels um, are frequently criticized in the literature by low levels of replicability. So which, what that means is if you put, um, if you do one panel uh, and, and run another panel on the same topic using the same protocol, you really oftentimes get um, different answers. So because that's the nature of the method, we want to make sure that we measure the extent to which the panel ratings are replicable. Um, so to collect the data, uh, we've used the Expert Lens platform. That's an online uh, platform for conducting modified Delphi panels. And our method in this case consisted of four different rounds. So let me tell you a little bit about each round. 
in the first round, we asked participants to share their ideas um, about the study topic, and I'll tell you more about exactly what we did. So this is an idea generation round. It was more open-ended. We've solicited um, the opinions of individuals with Duchenne and their caregivers on um, our idea behind the study. So and that's what we call idea generation round, and we also could refer to it as round zero, so I will refer to them um, as such inter in interchangeably. So then we ask um, a larger group of participants uh, to answer questions and explain their positions. So that's what we call round one or assessment round. Then in round two or feedback and discussion round, uh, we show participants how their own answers to round one questions compared to those of the group and allow them and encourage them to share their perspectives in an online discussion, debate each other's perspectives, reflect on their own opinions, and share those with other participants. And um, in round three or the reassessment round, we ask them to revise their original responses to round one questions based on group feedback and discussion. So let me tell you a little bit more about exactly how we use this Delphi-like structure for the purposes of engaging patients and caregivers in guideline development. So in the idea generation round, around one, we've asked a smaller group of participants, which included um, 25 um, caregivers and parents, as well as six individuals with Duchenne, um, to um, comment on what makes care patient-centered from their perspective. And we did it in a very open-ended fashion. We just asked them this question directly. Um, we also asked them to suggest and then rank uh, the reasons for why they might be seeking care for endocrine care. And endocrine care was the focus of this study, as I mentioned earlier, when um, the care considerations were revised, endocrine section was added as a new section. It includes four subsections. Uh, recommendations about vertical growth, weight management, bone health, and delayed pro uh, puberty. So we asked them to comment about the reasons why they would seek care for each of these four um, issues separately. And then we also asked them to suggest and rank order things that make it easier or more difficult to seek endocrine care for each of these four um, types of care. We also showed them the videos about our proposed um, plan to collect the data, the videos as to what would happen in subsequent rounds, round one, two, and three. And we asked them questions about um, ways to improve and refine our planned approach to collecting the data. So we used the results from round zero to help us finalize our method, operationalize patient-centeredness, that's the focus of what we want patients to contribute, their thoughts on patient-centeredness of the care recommendations. Um, we also use this results to describe patients' care preferences, needs, and values for endocrine. Um, we also include bone health care, but it really covers all four aspects of endocrine care here. So why we did that? Um, we did it to mirror what happened with uh, when uh, clinicians developed care considerations, because before they met in person and uh, used the Rangucelia appropriateness method, there was a literature review done on various um, recommendations or draft or whatever was uh, supposed to be part of um, the guidelines. Here, there is really no literature on patient preferences for. Um, what patients may want when it comes to endocrine care. So we've solicited patient input before the actual panel was conducted and fed that information from this round zero or idea generation round in subsequent rounds as an input into panel um, process. So then uh, we pilot tested our approach with a small group of uh, individuals with Duchenne and um, their caregivers. And after the pilot, we have really did a test of our methodology. And, and that's where we conducted a three-round panel, round one, round two, round three, that I showed you earlier. And to do that, we have um, uh, recruited 122 individuals with Duchenne and their caregivers to participate in a three-round process. Um, so out of the 122 uh, people who we invited, 
Uh, 95 were parents or caregivers, and 27 were adult individuals living with Duchenne. Um, that's a rare disease, and um, 27 is a very high number of people who uh, have the condition who are adults and uh, willing to participate, given that it's a rare disease. So we randomized 122 participants into two panels. Remember this idea of certainty in our determinations and replicability of panel findings? We wanted to make sure that we validate our findings by conducting two panels that are run concurrently using the same protocol. We also balance the panel. Um, so we randomized all the participants into one of the two panels and balanced the panel composition in terms of the proportion of uh, individuals with DMD and caregivers. In terms of the ambulation status of the individuals with Duchenne that caregivers give care to, uh, the caregivers' educational level, and the distance to a certified Duchenne center that they have to travel to actually get care for Duchenne. These things we thought might be affecting their perceptions of patient-centeredness of um, the recommendations. So out of 122 uh, individuals that we've invited, 97, uh, 95 or 78 percent participated in at least one round of the study. So one of the main uh, features of the Delphi method, in addition to the three that I've described, is really attrition. So you lose people every time you actually ask them to do something. That's common, and um, unfortunately, that's the reality of the methodology. So um, as I mentioned, out of 122 that were invited, um, 95 participated in at least one round, and 54 participated in all three rounds. So it's 57% participation rate uh, in the study if you look at those who did all three relative to those who did at least one. Um, let's see. So what we asked them to do is we, we asked them to uh, rate and comment on patient-centeredness of 19 endocrine care recommendations um, that were included in the revised care considerations. Um, we uh, use the rent UCLA appropriateness method to determine whether or not they've reached consensus and what the consensus was um, actually what uh, the consensus was on. Uh, we also thematically analyzed any explanations and discussion comments that happened uh, throughout the three rounds of the study. So, and at the end of the study, we've evaluated participant experiences with our online method. We asked them to complete a survey at the end of round one and round three, and we also interviewed a subsample of participants after the, all the rounds of, the, of this panel were complete. So you might be wondering as to what we mean by patient-centeredness um, so, uh, and why it's important to ask. Uh, participants to comment on this. Uh, so um, based on our round zero results, we operationalized patient-centeredness as the extent to which a guideline recommendation accounts for patients' care preferences, needs, and values. And for the purposes of um, the Delphi panel, we operationalized patient-centeredness as two different criteria. One is importance of the recommendation, and another one is acceptability of the recommendation. So in defining uh, importance, um, we instructed uh, participants to um, rate whether or not a the extent to which a clinical reason for a given recommendation is likely to be consistent with the preferences, needs, and values of Duchenne families in general. And in asking about acceptability, it's about the process of whether or not the process of following a given recommendation is likely to be consistent with available resources and ethical standards of Duchenne families in general. So I want to draw your attention to a couple of things here. The importance of asking participants to think beyond their personal experiences and think about Duchenne families in general. So that is something, uh, the idea is that we want them to think not only about their own personal experience, but that of the experience of others, because the guidelines 
would guide the care of other um, of Duchenne, uh, uh, individuals with Duchenne in general. Um, also because that's how the clinicians were rating appropriateness and necessity of their recommendations when they used the Rangicilla appropriateness method. So we wanted to not only replicate what clinicians were going through, uh, but also to make sure that um, these results are useful uh, moving forward and they're not really the opinion of one person, so to speak. So um, that's um, I want to draw your attention to um, this notion here. To allow participants to be more comfortable commenting on the experiences of Duchenne families in general, we provided them with the results of round zero where we asked, as you may recall, participants to comment on the reasons for seeking care, um, barriers to care, and facilitators of care. So these three things, the importance of um, uh, care and acceptability, we really tried to collect the data in round zero that could be useful for people to make a judgment about other Duchenne families when they're rating importance and acceptability in subsequent rounds. <clears throat> so let me show you exactly what participants did in round one. So in the assessment round, when they logged into the um, Expert Lens online platform, um, we showed them the instruction text, we've explained them what the ask is, and we showed them 19 recommendations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this recommendation have already been finalized, and this is a test, so to speak, the method development grant that's not really um, uh, meant to change the final wording of the guidelines, but to develop the method. So these recommendations have been finalized before participants in our study saw them. So for each recommendation, we used a brief explanation of what the recommendation is saying. We showed them the clinical reason why recommendation is important. We showed them a description of what following the process may entail. Uh, if they, we provided some hyperlinks for terms that may not be clear. So if they were to click on this, they would get to a link uh, that would show the definition of what spinal x-rays are. We also provided additional information that we felt would be important for participants to take into account as they're rating the importance of the clinical reason for giving this recommendation and acceptability of the process of following this recommendation. So we asked them for each recommendation to rate both on a nine-point scale. That's a scale, a nine-point scale is the same scale that clinicians use to rate appropriateness and necessity. Oops, I'm sorry. And we also asked them to comment um, on as to why they rated a certain recommendation as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, and specify the factors that affected their recommendation, uh, their response the most. So in the second round, uh, which is a feedback and discussion round, uh, we showed them um, their own response, which is on the chart um, with a red dot. Uh, we showed them what the group median response is, is the blue line. Uh, participants could hover over anything that you see on the screen here, and there would be a hover over explaining what that means. Um, most importantly, we also um, determined whether or not um, participants reached consensus and what they agreed upon in round one. And we color-coded those decisions. So you can see here it's in green font. Participants consider recommendation one to be important. So we determined this, made this determination using the RAND UCLA appropriateness approach to determining consensus. Exact same thing that clinicians, how clinicians determine whether or not care recommendation is, or indication is appropriate and necessary. Um, in addition to showing them the numeric results for each question asked, we analyzed their qualitative comments or the rationale comments, those comments that they put in those text boxes after each rating criterion, we analyzed them by tertile. So we first looked at what did people who rated this recommendation one, two, or three, the range of low or unimportant kind of ratings say. 
We indicated whether that particular theme was prevalent, uh, was mentioned uh, by patients only, caregivers only, or both. And we did do that for each fertile separately. So for each range of responses, low, medium, high, we did it separately. We showed we did that before the round um, to open. So when they log in into the feedback and discussion round, they would see what I'm showing you on the screen. So here I'm showing you just another um, question, another uh, recommendation, and how we did the same thing. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, the decision here changed in color. So it used to be green, indicating that they agreed that it was important. Here it is in blue, meaning that it is really uncertain. The group was not um, sure whether this really this recommendation is acceptable or not. Um, so let me zip through this. And then in round three, they would log back in into the system and um, uh, look, see um, what the group said in round one, the decision. And they would see the discussion that took place in round two, and they would be asked to provide their round three response, whether or not it changed, and uh, kind of explain their answers. So each round was open uh, for about 10 days. Uh, people get reminders um, if they haven't contributed to the round. There were about three reminders per round. And uh, each participant would get, um, as part of the study, $50 for completing a round. So that was our incentive amount uh, for this. Um, how did we determine patient-centeredness of guideline recommendations here? Um, so first, uh, we looked at the results for each panel separately, for each rating criterion separately, for each recommendation. So a recommendation um, would be considered important if there was no disagreement among participants and if, there, if the group median was 6.5 on 9-point scale or higher. So for us to say that a, a recommendation is patient-centered, within a given panel, panelists have to agree that it is both important and acceptable. So that's the first step. We looked at the results within each panel separately. And then we looked at the certainty of patient-centeredness recommendations. So we'll, here's the step where we look at two panels at the same time. So we are certain in the patient-centeredness of a given recommendation if both panels consider it to be important and acceptable. Um, we're a little less certain that um, a recommendation is patient-centered if a recommendation is considered both important and acceptable in one, but not in both panels. And we're even less certain about its patient-centeredness if it's deemed uncertain of uncertain importance and or uncertain acceptability in both panels. So um, let me briefly tell you, out of 19 recommendations, 12 were deemed patient-centered, meaning both panels considered it to be important and acceptable. Four recommendations were deemed important and acceptable, therefore, uh, by one panel. And three recommendations were deemed of uncertain patient-centeredness in both panels. So Brian, would you like to um, uh, take over and talk sure. about this? substantive findings, and I can advance slides for you. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. So uh, the, the data that you're going to be seeing are the results of the participant assessments, discussions, and, and the ratings of the recommendations, as uh, Dimitri has just outlined. The, uh, the, first, um, the first domain regards uh, delayed growth. And the individuals who participated, both caregivers and, and uh, young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, rated uh, three different uh, aspects of delayed growth recommendations um, as being patient-centered. Uh, the fact that height sh uh, should be assessed every six months from diagnosis through puberty, that impaired growth, which is assessed by uh, a bone age uh, identified in an X-ray for boys who are less than seven and eight to 12 were considered uh, patient-centered. And there was also a third recommendation uh, of individuals of, of boys between the ages of uh, 13 and 18, which was not deemed as uh, uh, patient-centered. Um, 
endocrinologist should identify and address uh, growth and delays was another uh, another area in which they agreed uh, was patient-centered. Next. Weight management. Um, uh, individuals who participated said nutritionists should evaluate uh, diet and emphasize family meals. They agreed that the nutritionists and family should work together on a nutritional plan, and they agreed with the recommendation that a physical therapist should emphasize family-focused activities, making it more meaningful for the, the individual and the entire family to participate in the activity. In terms of bone health, uh, the, they rated that a baseline and intermittent lateral lumbar x-rays uh, should, uh, should be defined with a Gannett score to be done for all boys. Uh, intermittent long bone imaging for those with osteoporosis risk, and that IV bisphosphonates should be considered after a certain low trauma long bone fractures, compression fractures, or moderate or severe Gannett scores. Last. The, uh, the issue of puberty, uh, the participants uh, found that the recommendation for endocrinologist referrals uh, with identified pubertal delays for those who are older than 14 years of age was appropriate, was patient-centered, uh, and that uh, graduated testosterone therapy to be performed to mimic typical pubertal development for those who are experiencing uh, uh, delays in puberty was also patient-centered. And I wanted to comment that the, the majority of the recommendations are, as, as you may notice, are, are evaluations and, and assessments, with only two being treatments, the use of IV bisphosphonate and testosterone treatment. But this should be taken lightly due to the nature of the interdisciplinary care that individuals and their families undergo. They often see multiple physicians and therapists at clinic uh, several times, um, up to two to three or four times a year, depending on whether they are just uh, receiving care locally or they go to an interdisciplinary clinic away from home. Um, in their discussion, participants debated the merits, ease of performing the evaluation and assessment, and discussed whether other disease-related issues merited more attention. Ultimately, they rated these recommendations as patient-centered. This speaks to the participants considering the entire clinical process from attending and adding appointments, the performing of treatment practices is crucial in determining what they considered patient-centered. Participants mentioned uh, encountering a lack of specificity for diet and exercise in the, uh, the weight management uh, domain, and they, rate, they rated these recommendations as patient-centered yet there was much agreement within their discussions of the need for greater detail of the practical measures to improve compliance. This feedback may possibly improve compliance with recommendations in these domains when families are provided with more detailed uh, recommendations. Next slide. So this next slide is a... Um, a couple of examples of recommendations that we were less certain about the patient-centeredness about. Uh, so in the, uh, the domain of puberty, pubertal status should be assessed by Tanner staging every six months starting at age nine. One panel deemed it to be of uncertain importance, importance suggesting that there are more important concerns than pubertal delays. The pubertal delay discussions were primarily focused on physical development, with comparisons being made to disease manifestation in other body systems, such as heart, pulmonary function, and bone health, which participants felt were more important. As the discussions developed, caregivers and the individuals who Duchenne participated did consider the emotional implication of delayed puberty. Next bullet. So they, they, were, they were concerned about testosterone replacement therapy being provided for those who are older than 14 years of age who have no signs of starting puberty and or who have low testosterone levels. Uh, they also, uh, they were, there was concerns about testosterone replacement therapy 
being considered in, in boys older than 12 taking glucocorticoid prednisone um, with absence of pubertal development. And in both situations, there were uh, the one panel deemed it to be of uncertain acceptability or an uncertain importance, raising concerns about the, the side effects interfering with natural development, which outweighed the importance of pubertal development. So only one panel considered three pubertal-related re recommendations to be patient-centered, largely because of the concerns about the relative unimportance of normal, normal pubertal development compared to physical development, including heart and pulmonary uh, function, as well as bone issues. Participants were also concerned about the potential negative side effects of various treatment options, as well as expected physical and psychological discomfort caused by following recommendations, pain, fear of uh, in, uh, injections, needles, uh, or uh, ultimately mood swings, which affected their ratings of importance and acceptability of these recommendations. So the focus on physical aspects of pubertal delay in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy highlights an opportunity for clinicians, for the clinical team to educate families about the psychosocial issues and an absence of maturity in people who have delayed onset of puberty, which may foster isolation from peers. Next slide. So in considering the use of uh, x-ray assessments for impaired growth for older boys with Duchenne, participants discussed a range of concerns, including causes of delayed growth, whether short stature was concerning to the individual or beneficial from a disease management standpoint, and their concerns with the use of growth hormone therapy. Many stated that by age 13, treatment opportunity may have passed. Interestingly, participants felt that the assessments might actually be uh, more acceptable due to the, the patients in this age range. Next bullet. So the use of um, growth, uh, human growth hormones should be reserved in treating children in three separate age groups only if they had abnormal growth hormones stimulation testing due to the inconclusive evidence about its effectiveness. Both panels thought that using these, uh, this therapy to address growth hormone, growth delays is not important enough given how painful, scary, expensive, and time consuming these treatments uh, would require, and that they would require daily injections as well. The side effects and the lack of evidence about the treatment effectiveness were also of concern to patients. Despite some agreement of the need to identify to identify delayed growth, participants were concerned about the risk and unknown benefits of this, uh, this treatment. They felt that it should be used only under specific circumstances. So this limited use of growth hormone therapy is consistent with the guidelines recommendation to use growth hormone therapy only for very specific indications, which was amplified by the participants in their discussions and in their concerns. So these, through the discussions, um, there, were, there was much debate about the tensions between the importance and acceptability. While it may be important to treat growth and pubertal delays to help boys deal with emotional and social isolation concerns, families worried about the potential side effects of the therapies that, that may be medically necessary. The ratings and discussions of patient-centeredness of recommendations related to vertical growth and puberty in particular revealed these tensions. Caregivers and individuals felt that the practical aspects of treatments along with the potential side effects trumped the potential benefits of ensuring normal growth and pubertal development. To illustrate, a quote from one of the caregivers said, was said, I am just concerned about steroids and testosterone I would be concerned about their emotional well-being after treatment. These tensions between importance and acceptability suggest that there is a need to better inform families of the rationale for assessment and treatment. A good example of that, this exchange about the acceptability of growth hormone related to pubertal delay in which a caregiver stated the recommendation to treat and initiate 
pubertal development gives parents false hope. An individual of Wu Shen responded, I definitely disagree. I'm not sure what you mean by this. I'm 28 years old with Duchenne and have graduated with a bachelor's degree. I'm not sure I would have been mature enough to do this if I hadn't gone through puberty. Next bullet. And there were also differences between the caregivers and the individuals with Duchenne and how they viewed many of the particular aspects of within the, the discussions. Although normal pubertal development may not be a major concern for parents and caregivers, it is something that the boys with the Shen did worry about because it affected their self-esteem. The difference in the opinions between caregivers and in individuals led to different uh, interesting discussions based on their perspectives. Um, using uh, vertical growth as another example, uh, one of the caregivers uh, spoke about height is important to most of the guys and therefore to their families, but it's not likely that their height will be comparable to healthy boys and actually having a smaller stature may be a benefit to their mobility. An individual with Duchenne responded, it is important to start early in terms of initiating these therapies to see in assessments to see if the growth problem exists before starting effective treatment and before it affects affects self-esteem. A caregiver responded, I found this to be something that means more to my son than to me, so I think it needs to be monitored and may be treated around puberty age. However, it should be compared more to their own growth trend than to others. And in another exchange regarding pubertal delays, one caregiver made the comment that puberty is not vital to longevity and at age nine, seems early to start worrying about it. In response, an individual with Duchenne said, is self-esteem and quality of life as important as longevity? The response was, self-esteem and quality of life is way more valuable than longevity. Great point. So these differences that indicate that one perspective or opinion is superior, it's simply different. And it emphasizes the value, including both it, both vantages for a more thorough discussion regarding importance and acceptability. Ultimately, using both advantage, both vantages is needed in determining what is truly patient-centered. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, just as you see from this slide, the fact that we've operationalized patient-centeredness as importance of the outcome and acceptability of the process is really fruitful here because we can um, uh, differentiate between recommendations that may be trying to achieve important goals, but, but the process of following them may not be acceptable and vice versa. Uh, the fact that uh, caregivers and individuals with Duchenne both contributed to our study um, is really another strength of the methodology that was particularly emphasized by our study participants, as I will show you on subsequent slides. Uh, another thing to note is that you might be wondering uh, what does it mean that a particular recommendation was not deemed patient-centered in our panel? What should we do with those? Um, how should we treat that finding? Well, uh, I think we should not automatically dismiss these recommendations. Um, uh, such care considerations and recommendations might be uh, if that, that could be a sign that these uh, recommendations might be highly preference sensitive, conditional, or context specific, and uh, that could be a sign that individuals with Duchenne and caregivers may want to discuss these recommendations with clinicians, look at the reasons why these care considerations were not deemed patient-centered in our study, and um, also reviewing a list of potential concerns raised by our study participants can inform the development of patient decision aids, can help providers who do not really see a lot of patients with Duchenne as it's a rare disease. Um, it can help them initiate discussions that focus on the aspects of care that may be potentially problematic for Duchenne families. And such discussions can bring patient preferences into clinical decision making directly and breach the gap between the evidence-based clinical care and patient values and um, the kind of preferences that patient-centered care seeks to achieve. Um, this is all good for the fact that um, we worked on the recommendations that have already been finalized. 
ideally all this information would feed into uh, uh, the stage before the guideline wording has been finalized. So let me share you um, uh, let me share with you the results of our evaluation of the method. So what did patients say about their own experiences? So we asked them satisfaction questions at the end of round one and round three. So I'm showing you at the results of some surveys that we've done at the end of round three. So participants used seven-point agreement scales, and here we've uh, recoded um, answers one, two, and three into agree segment, uh, we kept four as being a neutral response, and then we recoded uh, five, six, and seven, I'm sorry, uh, one, two, three, disagree, five, six, seven, agree. Um, so here you will see that more than two-thirds of um, our study participants felt that they would like to use the platform in the future. 71% um, felt that the system was easy to use, so we were originally concerned about the fact that whether they would even kind of understand um, what we were asking them to do, whether uh, the fact that it's all online, it will be difficult for them to use, and uh, these results show it doesn't seem to be the case. 80% um, feel that the participation in the study met their expectations. 83% agreed that participation in the study was satisfying, and 89% felt that it was uh, they were able to express their views on the study topic. So I think it's quite positive um, feedback that we've received from participants here. To unpack it a little bit more, I uh, would like to tell you about the uh, kinds of things that um, participants were sharing with us as we were doing the interviews with 25 um, participants who participated in the study. So out of those 20 were caregivers and five were individuals with Duchenne. So what did they think about our proposed approach to engaging patients and, and caregivers in guideline development using online modified Delphi system? So they felt that the online process encouraged learning and promoted community building. So it built their capacity and it allowed them to interact with others. For rare disease, it's particularly important uh, to actually find um, other families who go through similar experiences. So the participants appreciated learning what other people have to say. They also liked the fact that um, they not only were asked to rate them, but also to explain why they rated a particular recommendation in a certain way. So it's really understanding um, why things uh, are rated in, in, in a particular way that's important for them. So that shows that this kind of mixed methods approach is really uh, of benefit to study participants themselves. So here's a comment from a caregiver. Um, they appreciated the fact that they uh, could revise their original response at the end of the discussion. Um, so that's what the iterative data collection uh, allows you to do. On the one hand, you kind of lose people between rounds. On the other hand, it gives uh, participants an opportunity to fine-tune their perspective and kind of revise their responses based on the new information that they've learned throughout this process. Um, they also appreciated the fact that discussion allowed them to understand the perspective uh, of other people and learn what uh, is likely to come next, especially if they are providing care to children who are a little younger. So uh, that was particularly true about the uh, pubertal um, section. So the other thing that uh, participants uh, appreciated about the methodology is that they liked its convenience, anonymity, and a synchronous nature. Um, they felt that this way of providing input is much more convenient uh, than, say, um, doing a survey um, or doing actually more of an in-person engagement. Um, they liked the fact that the platform allowed them to um, not to answer all of the questions in one sitting. Um, they could do some and then come back later um, while still a particular round is uh, open. So caregivers uh, actually like the fact that uh, it was an anonymous uh, engagement. We did reveal the stakeholder group, whether a participant was a caregiver or an individual with Duchenne, and we gave them um, like a user ID, so to speak, that would say a caregiver um, you know, A01, that stands for a panel A caregiver number one, uh, but they didn't really know who others were. So a third thing that they liked was the discussion helped participants clarify um, their perspective, uh, but at the same time it didn't uh, really um, 
require them to change their answers. So if we look at the quantitative findings, the difference between round one ratings and round three ratings, the change in their uh, overall ratings um, was not always huge. Um, so what that said, this quotation suggests is that although participation through a three-round process may not have um, made them change their ratings, it actually, um, the reasoning behind their answers might have changed. So um, that further supports the need for iterative data collection. Um, I think uh, this quotation from a caregiver suggests that there was a lot of learning on, the, on behalf of participants. We've actually gotten several requests for copies of the discussion board comments after the study was over because they felt that that discussion, was, discussion comments were useful uh, for them when they um, go to talk to a provider during um, a, a provider visit. Um, finally, our method, um, they felt that the method is useful for bringing the patient voice and guideline development. Um, so it actually helps to see what clinicians are thinking about and what patients and caregivers are thinking about and kind of blending the two perspectives together. And um, uh, participants felt that uh, the results of the study would be useful for clinicians uh, because it really would help them better understand the experiences of families and individuals with Duchenne and that could really um, facilitate the shared decision making during the um, encounters. So. In summary, um, what do we think that this method is most useful for? We believe that it is useful for engaging large and diverse groups of patients and caregivers because there's really no limitation on how many people um, you would collect your data from. If you actually have a very large pool of potentially interested participants, you would then randomize them into several panels. Um, that allows you to uh, improve their discussion participation experiences on the one hand, but it also gives you a methodological benefit of looking at the replicability of panel findings to kind of determine the certainty of uh, your determinations of patient-centeredness. I think it helps implement evidence to decision framework by actually looking at both importance of the outcome and the acceptability of the process of following that recommendation. It helps you solicit uh, patient and caregiver perspectives, ideally before the guideline recommendations are finalized. It helps you with rapid and international guideline development. The fact that it's online it does not require participants to travel to a centralized location. It can be useful for updating care guidelines. We believe that um, it's not only patients who can be engaged using the platform or the method that we're developing, but also the actual um, clinicians as well to rate appropriateness, necessity, or whatever else might need to be rated. Um, it is also interesting to note that uh, the discussion, the content of the discussion can help identify factors that may affect guideline compliance from patient uh, and caregiver experiences. So usually the literature on guideline compliance focuses on um, the clinician's perspective. Here, identifying factors that can affect uh, Patients following their willingness to follow recommendation is really um, important. And so what are some of our next steps? So we are doing a more in-depth analysis of qualitative data to identify the reasons for high, low, and uncertain ratings, as well as identify um, factors that affect people's willingness to change their responses between round one and round three ratings. Um, that's what I just said. Um, uh, we're writing some um, results to publish in peer-reviewed journals. Some have already been published, others are in the works. Um, we're also interested in validating our approach to um, patient engagement in the context of other diseases. So we understand that we've developed it uh, with a sample of two panels, uh, one condition. So we're interested in kind of testing it in other conditions and um, hoping that you may have some suggestions and the best ways of doing so. So I would like to thank our team members. So we have researchers from RAND, uh, partners from uh, PPMD, as well as our advisory board, includes patient, caregivers, um, guideline developers. So thank you very much for all our team members. And uh, I would like to open this for a discussion. So Mary, would you be able to? 
Hi, Dimitri. Thank you so much for this wonderful and engaging discussion. I think the guideline community is really always seeking for an effective method of engaging patients, and this is definitely a method to consider and one hopefully organizations can replicate and customize according to their needs. Um, we have a couple of questions already in, so I'll start. Um, so this was a test, you said. You engaged yeah. patients after the recommendations were finalized. I'm wondering yeah. if you've had an opportunity to test, attempt this where it's happening simultaneous to recommendation development. That's our goal. Uh, unfortunately, due to funding restrictions, we were not able to do that before the guidelines were finalized, and we had to work with already final uh, recommendations. But ideally, uh, we would want to do that because uh, what that would allow us to do is to see what impact this feedback uh, from patients and caregivers could have on the way that the guidelines are uh, formulated. Uh, hopefully with down the road testing the impact of engagement that has on compliance with guidelines on the um, on the part of um, patients and caregivers. Okay, that's good to know. Um, someone had asked, I think you mentioned already, but if you don't mind repeating, who funded this um, project? Uh, PCORI funded. This is part of its methods development uh, study uh, program. Okay. So and then developing were there, a method for engaging patients in guideline development. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any training involved for the patient and caregiver participation? Did you feel that they needed mm -hmm. training about guideline development or guideline methodology to understand what you were asking of them? That's an excellent question. Uh, we deliberately wanted to avoid the need to train uh, participants on uh, the guideline development aspect. We want it to be a low burden uh, uh, approach, but we did offer educational videos on what we are asking them to do and why we ask them to do. So we prepared videos um, that briefly explain the purpose of the ask and what we want them to do and how we want them to do. So because the Delphi method is not as commonly used as, say, a survey, one of the common problems with the Delphi is, as I mentioned, attrition. So we early on um, made sure that we uh, would tell them what their participation in the whole project would involve, that there are three rounds that they would need to go through. And um, at, at the start of each round, as part of our introductory materials, we've included a brief video explaining what they would be doing as part of the study. So there was training, but it was a little bit different nature of the training that we felt would be needed for participants to go through. Great. Okay, there are some technical questions people have submitted. Um, was the comment box in the system and the um, expert lens a forced comment box, meaning that they have to fill in to move forward? I do not believe so. Uh, in round one and three, um, it was not forced. Um, we did not force any questions. Um, they could skip uh, whatever questions they didn't feel comfortable answering. Um, we did have a feature that I did not talk about in the discussion round where they, um, uh, what we call a thumbs up, thumbs down feature, where they were commenting on a comment made by somebody else. So if they do thumbs up, they would be asked to comment as to why they're agreeing or disagreeing with a particular comment. Great. Um, is this work going to be published as a supplement to the existing CDC guidelines on the condition? I do not know whether it will be as a supplement, but we do have several articles either under review or in progress that would share the results of this work. And uh, uh, we're going to give a talk at CDC in June on the substantive results. Um, we do have on the advisory board a representative of CDC who worked on uh, the original development. So CDC is well aware of the work that we're doing here. Okay. Um, there's an inquiry about evaluations and feedback from the per patient participants. Were mm -hmm. they presented to the guideline committee by one or more representatives? And if not, did the guideline committee consider the surveys only when writing guidelines without the patients present to discuss? I think this would have uh, applied more if 
the guide final recommendations were not finalized. I'm not sure I follow the question, uh, but I think I understand what the intent of the question is. Um, so the we worked off of the guidelines that have already been finalized. So uh, the guideline development group uh, finished its work before we really did the patient engagement panel. So they were not aware of what we found because they finished their work prior. So we really feel, uh, collected the data two months after the guidelines have been published in the Lancet Neurology. So if, it, if you were to do it mm -hmm. while the recommendations were being developed, how do you envision the patient caregiver input being submitted to the committee? I think we would want to, what we want to ideally do is when the draft recommendations are created, we would want to do this panel at that time and then feed the feedback to the guideline development group before they finalize the, um, the guidelines. It could be done a little earlier as well, um, but that's my current thinking and I welcome feedback because uh, by training I'm not a guideline developer, so if um, participants in this webinar have suggestions for how it could be used, um, that would be greatly appreciated. So I think uh, there, we also are interested in um, identifying other opportunities to use the method at other stages of development, but uh, I guess we have to focus on something <laughs> to develop the method. So right now we're at the other stage of our thinking where we think about how we can use it for other purposes as well. Great. Um, someone has asked, can you comment on the major limitations of this method versus other patient input methods, such as focus groups, individual GDT member input? We've observed that online feedback methods aren't well received by patients, perhaps a generational issue to some extent. Um, it, I think it depends on how you solicit the input online. So um, I think that is important. The generational issue is also um, of concern. So when I started uh, in, you know, um, my interest in online expert elicitation and patient engagement about 10 years ago, I was told that nobody ever would want to do anything online. Um, and um, I don't really see that happening. I see more and more people interested in participating online rather than in person given the convenience. Um, I think if I were to think about the major limitations, as would be a attrition for the because of the Delphi structure, the iterative data collection, you actually lose people, so you have to account for that as you're developing and assembling your panel. Um, another limitation might be that if you do not have um, an engaging discussion moderator and uh, an easy to use engagement platform, people may not be um, happy. So that is why we kind of solicit their feedback and implement the feedback in the way that we change um, how we do this after each study. So, I'm, and I mentioned briefly that we did a pilot uh, before we ran a three-round panel. And as part of the panel, uh, as part of the pilot, what we saw was that people were not really commenting um, when they were expressing their agreement. They didn't always say why, they just said agree. And so we've implemented the thumbs up, thumbs down feature where it actually asks you to comment as to why uh, you're agreeing or disagreeing with a particular uh, comment. So this is to say that we're constantly trying to implement new features and improve it as we go. Thank you. So Brian, can I add a, a couple of comments sure. about this? So yeah, in, in, in looking at uh, considering the question, um, I, I think that there are advantages to this method that may have been overlooked. When you typically would have a, a focus group, you select from a, a rather narrow um, group within the patient community, and they're typically more fluent, able to travel. Uh, there's a number of factors that can be exclusionary by that very uh, nature of uh, who is available. And I think that when you look at access and the, the concept of compliance of standards of care, you, you want 
I, in my opinion, you, I think you would want as many voices uh, engaged as possible. So I think that the uh, the online version in which you're able to bring many, many more patients together in this forum to uh, to seek out that information uh, or to, to solicit their information is, is exceptionally important. The, the other aspect that I think that was interesting is in the acceptance of the uh, of this media. And I think that many people um, now are more familiar with social media, beginning with uh, uh, list serves that uh, professional societies used to utilize, uh, but also uh, other uh, social media that's available out there. People are more comfortable with expressing themselves. And the, while the, there was a uh, anonymous nature to the, uh, to the people's uh, participation, they did realize uh, there were identifiers suggesting that was an individual who had the condition. There was a, a caregiver of a, of a child, or uh, and you can you can break that down a little further. So I think that that gives them some sort of uh, continuity or some sort of uh, uh, comfort in that they're with among a group of people who uh, who share similar circumstances as they do. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I wanted to mention one more thing. I think one of the limitations is that we would need their email address to uh, allow them to participate. So it's all based on the email addresses, the login information. So if someone doesn't have an email address or doesn't have access to the Internet, um, that could be a problem. Uh, we would not be able to engage them. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I have a question for you. And uh, you noted that um, it was conveyed in some of the comments that it would be better if families were informed about the rationales of recommended treatments. I wonder how you envision that rationale being delivered to patients and or caregivers. Do you envision that to be, do you think it would be more effective if that was developed in person at a meeting or provided alongside the survey questions? Well, the what I was thinking was that when you develop the guideline, that there would be a, uh, a prompt for a clinician to to provide that information to individual patients at at a uh, at an appointment, um, okay. and and I think that that's the in my opinion the the best way for that to be addressed. Oftentimes, um, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the you know, the only treatment available is uh, glucocorticoids is steroids. And there's a whole force of negative side effects that are associated with it, but it's considered gold standard in terms of treatment because it does uh, delay the uh, the loss of ambulation. It helps with pulmonary cardiac function, um, and but families through other experiences, whether themselves personally or through other family members, understand that the uh, the negative side effects can be uh, can be rather troublesome. But I think that when they do go to an appointment, using that as an example, the clinician will explain to them, here's the, here's the benefits, here's the, the risks, here's, here's how we would address those. I think that same element can be utilized in, in any number of uh, treatment protocols that, that tend to be uh, more involved or uh, more troubling for, for patients and families. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're going back to more of a process question here. How much does this approach add to guideline development time, and can it be scaled to multiple guideline projects? Um, our approach was to develop a scalable solution for engagement. Um, so as I mentioned, each round was open for um, seven to 10 days, I think 10. We usually say that it's open for a week, and then we extend uh, the round deadlines. Um, if I recall, it was you know a week or maybe two weeks maximum for each round. So uh, you could be done within a month. Um, you, we've tried different time frames, not for this particular study, but for other panels that we've done. Um, I would say 10 days is a good amount of days, a good number of days for um, each round. So you could be done within a month. Um, the other advantage of an online platform is that 
the data are analyzed, the rating data are analyzed automatically. So there is no need to manually analyze whether or not there is agreement and what the agreement is on. So that is done on the back end. So as soon as round one is uh, over, you can start round two um, right away. And then once the panel is over and you need to feed the results back to your guideline development group, you know, the charts are generated, the charts that I saw, that, that I showed you, are generated automatically um, by the platform. So you kind of just print it out um, if you want to. Um, so you can, we, you can do multiple panels concurrently. Uh, I don't think there is a huge uh, capacity uh, on the server, uh, burden on the server if, need, if multiple panels are run. So. Great. Uh, one last question from our participant. Did you get feedback from those who disagreed, meaning those who indicated they did not believe they had a chance to present their views? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So is the question, so we did ask a question whether you felt that you, your views, you were able to kind of express your opinions. I and think that's probably what it's asking, yeah. So some people, uh, so that was only a rating question on in a battery of satisfaction questions. Um, however, we did so basically we did not sample based on the negative response to this question into our interviews sample, but we did talk to people. Um, our interview sample was diverse in that we've tried to recruit those who did not do all rounds uh, and those who might not have had overall. Um, as high of an uh, you know satisfaction with the process as 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 the average satisfaction, um, I I do not remember top of my head what is it exactly that there were they were concerned about. I think um, even though we've kept it open for about a month, people were not always available to do that at a given week. I think the other comment from caregivers was that um, you know the burden of caregiving prevented them from participating to the extent that they wanted. They would one have to spend more time um, doing this. Uh, uh, but these were the two that I can think of. Um, I, I, I can get back to you as to what is it exactly that they, their concerns were at a later point if you're interested. Sure, thank you. So I think that come, that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. We do not have any additional questions submitted. If you do think of a question after the end of the webinar, please feel free to contact the speakers directly or email us at, at the GIN mailbox or um, I'm trying to get that uh, email up. Email us at gin na at g at g n dot net. Um, if you cannot reach Dimitri and uh, Brian directly, I can forward your questions to them directly myself. Um, Dimitri and Brian, thank you so very much for um, sharing your project with us, your um, years of work, and a really exciting opportunity for the guideline committee. We look forward to where you take this work, and we hope it becomes accessible to a lot of us, or all of us who are in the struggling with um, finding ways to effectively engage patients and caregivers. So thank you. We look forward to hearing from you in the future. And um, please join us again in two weeks when we speak with Dr. Holger Schunemann about GRADE, what's new, what's next. So thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye.